What's up, church? That was some good worship, amen? At this time, all the kids are dismissed. Why don't you give the kids a hand? They're going to go enjoy some kids' service now. Awesome, awesome. Well, we're getting into week one of last words, and I'm going to tell you something from the, to just kind of start off today. Uh, I'm excited for this, and um, your boy right here has preached 17 services in a row, and uh, I needed a time to recharge, and so I can keep bringing you good, fruitful ministry, amen? I needed, uh, I needed some time on, on this week, and so uh, I, I had asked one of my good friends, I've been trying to get him down here forever, and uh, to just come down and bring a word to open up this series, and so I could have a break, and um, I could get a break this week and get ready and prep for Easter, because Easter is right around the corner. And so I uh, asked my friend, uh, Pastor Paul Musso, he is from Healing Place Church in Baton Rouge, if you know that church there, uh, it's a very uh, big church that's doing a lot of great things for the Lord, and, and it's incredible, and uh, pa I'll let him tell a little bit more about what he does or anything like that, but I can tell you guys, whenever I bring somebody here on stage, they got to they gotta almost pass test in my head. Because this is a this is a, a pulpit that you gotta you get to stand behind and deliver God's word. So I don't want somebody who can just talk the talk, but I want to bring somebody who's integrity, who has integrity, who can be honoring, who walks the walk, you know, walks faith. And I can tell you something about Paul is man, he he don't just talk it, he walks it. He's full of faith. And man, I'm telling you, every time I, I sit with him, I, I had breakfast this morning, I get to have lunch again with him, and every time I sit with him, I just get so inspired by him and, and what they're doing. And I love the guy to death. And so I just want to know, man, you're honored at this house already. Your family, dude, we love you. I thank you so much from my heart for giving me, helping me have a week off so I can, you know, this week God's been speaking to me, and I'm so excited to get into what's to come. And, uh, and guys, I just want you guys to help me give a big Church on a Mission welcome for Paul Musso. Come on, man. You're awesome, dude. Love you, dude. Thank you so much. It's yours. Come on, clap your hands for your pastor. Come on. How are we doing this morning? Oh, come on. I think you can do a little better than that. How you doing? They're doing good. Awesome, awesome. Anybody buy any RVs on the way in? No purchases? <laughs> I looked out there and I thought, man, that's not my kind of crowd, you know? I just, <laughs> I don't know if I'm spending my Sunday uh, looking at RVs. Um, but I am honored to be here. I really am. I'm privileged and honored to be a part and uh, I have been wanting to come down here for a little minute now, and, uh, and uh, Pastor Ryan's been trying to get me to come, and I'm like, man, just let me come and just, let me just serve and be a part. He's like, no, you need to preach. I'm like, no, nah, man, I don't know about that. You might lose some members after this Sunday uh, if, if I come, come and preach, but uh, I, am, I am honored to be a part. Him and Leah, y'all are doing a fantastic job, and uh, I lean over to my dad and my, my wife. I lean over them in worship, and I say, you know, I've, I've never planted a church, but what I've seen from friends, it is hard work, and you've got to have people who are resilient, that refuse to give up, and keep pushing through, amen? And so you have some awesome, awesome pastors, so please, please clap your hands for Pastors Ryan and Leah doing a fantastic job. But before I continue on, I want to honor my wife. Come on, we met back in high school when we were 16 years old. Uh, it was love at first sight for me, for her, it might have been the fourth or fifth sight, but we are in it to win it, and uh, we have a little son named Elijah Michael, and uh, he is cute by his looks, but mean in his personality, and uh, so we're praying for his salvation. He needs Jesus ASAP, uh, but we're still working on that. If you could pray for me, and then I have uh, my dad, one of my best friends, my dad. We call him Papa Moose. Uh, he's here with me as well, and uh, love my dad, and my phone, it doesn't say dad. It doesn't say Papa. It says my hero, uh, because he is my hero, and I love him. And I'm thankful for his life and his influence in my world. Um, but today, uh, we are starting this series called Last Words. Turn to your neighbor and say, Last Words. Come on, tell him you're the best looking thing I've seen all day. Some of you hesitated. Wow, that was, that was intense. You're like, ah, I don't know. I may have seen better on the way in. Uh, but, <laughs> but we're starting this series called Last Words, and, and as Jesus was on the cross, how many know that he had some last words, some things that he said at the very um, end of his life, some things that while he was on the cross, uh, I imagine, man, the pain and the agony that he went through, and then how much weight and depth those words hold, amen? amen. 
And so today, uh, I want to talk to you about the art of forgiveness. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, forgive me. I didn't brush my teeth. <laughs> but today, I want to talk to you about the art of forgiveness. And I want to read you two passages um, out of Luke chapter 15. We're going to start in Luke chapter 15. And it says, the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, all those years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never gave me one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, uh uh-oh, he ain't playing no games, squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. And his father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me. And everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now is found. That's the, the story of the prodigal son. The second, <clears throat> the second verse I want to read to you is found eight chapters later, same book, Luke chapter 23, in verse 34. These are some of the last words of Jesus. Verse 34 says, Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they are doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. So today I want to talk to you about the art of forgiveness. God, we love you. Thank you so much for today. God, thank you for every single person that is here, every single person that has decided to come and worship today, decided whether they felt like it or not, they got out of bed. Uh, They had to brave through all of the RVs, uh, God, to get here to church, Lord. But it's all for one reason, and that's you. God, the truth is, is it does not matter who holds this microphone. What matters is the one that hung on that cross. And Jesus, we're so thankful for your sacrifice. We're thankful for your grace that is on our life. So God, as I speak today and as I share some things I believe that you have laid on my heart, Lord, as always, Paul steps out of the way and Jesus, you step in. God, it's not about me, Lord. It's all about you. Lord, we love you. We thank you. God, may somebody give me an RV today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. My wife and I, we are, uh, we're selling our home, and uh, nobody warned you about, I don't even know how to word this, warned you about all the hassle of selling your home. Anybody ever sold your home before? You, you put your house up for sale? It is a lot of work. I mean, it, we, you know, you got to get these pictures taken, and then the, the to-do list that she has made over the last four years while we've lived in this home has suddenly all come to my face, and now I have to do them. Any men know what I'm talking about? And it's all these long lists, and we do all these things, and, and we get the floor replaced, and we paint these walls that need to be painted and fix some of the toilets and this, that, and the other. And, and then what happens is you put your house on the market, and I'm new to this, so please excuse me, but I'm new to this, and so you put your house on the market, And at any moment, their realtor can call your realtor and say, hey, we want to see the house. And you may have a day, you may have an hour to get your house ready for somebody to come and look at your house. You know what I'm talking about. So my wife has compiled this short list of 21 things that every day, I'm not even joking, I'll show you on my phone, I counted this morning when I I was writing this down, 21 items before we leave the house in the morning of things that we have to do. So that any moment our house is ready It's prepared. Uh, If anybody wants to come in and look at it, hopefully they like what they see and they give us a lot of money. Can all God's people say amen? Amen. And so every day before we leave the house, I have this list on my phone and I go through and I make sure the beds are made, make sure the trash is taken out. Because how many know you don't want them to walk in your son's room and it smell like just a nasty diaper? You know what I'm saying? So you're taking the trash out. You're making sure the, the toilet seats are down. And then you have to angle the blinds at a 45 degree angle. So when the sun shines in, it's like, does this really matter, people? Do you like the house or not, you know? And it's this long list of things. And what's so devastating is, like, so, uh, was it Saturday? Was it yesterday or Friday? Yesterday, I think it was, we had, like, our, fir- our first showing. And so uh, we have to get out the house. It's weird. Like, you have to leave everything you've known for people you don't even know to come into your house. I'm like, man, I'm hiding all my good stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like, I love shoes, so I'm like, I'm hiding these Adidas. I'm putting these Jordans in my back seat. You know, like, I'm not leaving anything because I don't want nobody to take anything, you know. But they come in and they see the house all for uh, the hopes of that they just might buy it. They just may purchase the home. But you can do all that for them to walk away and not even purchase your home. It's this, like, roller coaster of emotions. 
So we get a call yesterday from our realtor, and he says, hey, I want you to know that their realtor called me, and uh, y'all are in the top three. And they're going to decide, they, they're going to decide last night, they said they're going to decide. And I was like, man, like, can I get their number and call them and tell them, like, my dad's a really good cook, and we'll send them food. You know, like, you're in the top three, and, and it's so, it's so much pressure, and, but you don't even know if they're really going to buy your home. Because on the other end, they have a list of things that they want in a house. Like when you go house hunting, you got a list of things that you want. When we bought this house, one of the things that we loved was that it had separate closets. I love that because, oh man, to share a closet with this beautiful woman, I mean, you got to pray hard, you know what I'm saying? But so it's separate closets and a separate shower and a tub. There's little things that we liked in the house, and, but you don't know what the other people are looking for. You don't know what they want in the middle of their house hunting. And it's all of that just for them to, for them to possibly say no. And when I think about the term forgiveness and when I think about what we walk through in different relationships, whether it be with your parents or your siblings or your best friends or coworkers or all those things, at the end of the day, you may do all this stuff to try to be friends with somebody or to have a relationship with someone. But on the other end, they may have different interests in mind. They may have other things that they want. And maybe we didn't do something in our house that that couple wanted to buy our house. Just like in relationships, you may have done something or not done something that the other person has wanted or that might have happened to you, and you have unforgiveness towards somebody. And what happens is the other person that you may have unforgiveness towards is having to, to do things that they don't even know what they really should be doing to get your approval. Because we lack the authenticity to just simply say, I forgive you. Or maybe you're in the hot seat and you would just wish somebody would tell you, hey, I forgive you. Maybe you wish somebody would extend forgiveness. So whether you're receiving forgiveness or extending forgiveness, man, it's a tough spot to be in, is it not? And so today when I read this story about the prodigal son and I think about Jesus, one of his last phrases as he's on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. That just speaks to me, man, Jesus had a lot of grace. Amen. Amen. A man who's hanging on the cross, who has blood dripping down his face and nails in his hands and in his feet. He says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. But in this other story with the prodigal son, we have an older son, an older uh, brother who is mad at his younger brother and says there's no way. The very first verse, the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. They're throwing a party that, they're, that the youngest son has come home, and he says, no, I'm not going in and celebrate. He had a lot of unforgiveness, would you say not? And I want to share just with you three points today about unforgiveness. The first point is this, is your future is attached to forgiveness. Your future is attached to forgiveness. The gap that stands between where you are now and where God wants to bring you just might be a gap called forgiveness. That it is so hard to move forward when you're constantly thinking about your past. One of the main things that will stop you from progressing into your future is you replaying your past. And I'm not speaking from a place of perfection, church. I'm speaking from a place where I've had to come to grips with certain things and forgive people because I realize that no matter how bad I wanted to get over there, no matter how bad I wanted to step into what God has for me, no matter how bad I wanted to move forward in the calling he's placed on my life, if I had unforgiveness, there was this gap right here that would not allow me to get to here because I chose to not forgive somebody. And I've learned that my future is connected to forgiveness. Unforgiveness, we've probably all heard this saying, is like drinking poison and expecting it to kill the other person. You ever heard that saying? That unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting it to hurt the other person. Unforgiveness is like placing a debt over someone's life and realizing in the end that it's on your own life. Unforgiveness is thinking that you're holding someone back. Well, I'm not going to forgive them because I want them to know how they made me feel. Have we been there before? Can we be honest? And what happens is you think you're holding someone back, but then you get this revelation, you look in the mirror, and you realize the person you're holding back is not them, but it's yourself. 
And you're trying to move forward. You're trying to step into everything that God has for you. But there's a gap called forgiveness that you are not choosing to cross over. Because it can be tough. Don't expect to move forward if you have not forgiven anyone. Don't allow your past to rob you of your future. I mean, I've heard stories before where, where, where sons and fathers have gone 10 years without talking because there, there was unforgiveness. Because one of them refused to say, you know what, I'll take the high road and, and maybe I'll just say that I was wrong. Because at the end of the day, their future is not in your hands, it's in God's hands. And your future is not in their hands, it's in God's hands. But he will allow that gap to teach you a lot in order to bring you into what he has for you. Because if he wants to teach you something right here, but you're wanting to get over there, if you were to step over here in your future before you're ready in what God has for you, you haven't learned what may be able to sustain you right here. And if we haven't learned it right here in our present, why would we ever step into our future because we can't, uh, humble ourselves and deal with our past. Your future, man, it is connected to forgiveness. It is attached to forgiveness. There are too many people walking around today, and you know these people when you see them. They just got that mean, like, stank face, you know? They're just, how you doing? Oh, how am I doing? You're like, no, I didn't I didn't mean to ask that question. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I'll call you later. Never. <laughs> but too many people are walking around in the present, but emotionally and relationally living in the past. But you cannot forget that your future is attached to forgiveness. We place expectations on people. I think that's where it gets a little dangerous. And one, one time somebody told me, he said, you know, Paul, placing an expectation on someone is actually just premeditated resentment. And I thought, Oh, my gosh. And I began to think about relationships or maybe past coaches I had in baseball. You're like, you wear skinny jeans. No way you play baseball. <laughs> but coaches and friendships and relationships and family members and these types of things. And I realized I'd placed expectations on people. And most times we hardly ever meet someone's expectations. And they hardly ever meet ours. And then what happens after that? is we become bitter. Listen to this definition of, of bitterness. Anger and disappointment in being treated unfairly. Resentment. So we have an expectation. Somebody doesn't meet that expectation. We get bitter. And then after bitterness sets in, it gives life to unforgiveness. And we allow bitterness for one of two reasons. That person should have done something they didn't because we expected them to, or they did something that we didn't want them to. And we allow bitterness to fill, to, to fill our lives, and we fail to forgive that person. So we hold unforgiveness over a relationship or a friendship to our mom or to our dad. And the most dangerous part of it is, is we want them to do something to be able to gain our trust back, or we want them to say something or do a certain action so it would make it finally right for us to forgive them, but yet we never tell them what we would appreciate if they would do. So then what happens is we place a debt over their life and they have to pay back a debt in a currency that they don't know. You ever been out of the country before? Man, I'll never forget when I went to Africa and I, I remember going there and one of our dollars was, I think, was equal to seven of theirs. That currency was a little different. But then there's sometimes when you go to other countries, like if you ever go to Italy or Europe, man, you lose money. <laughs> the currency is not the same. But we do the same thing. We place a debt over someone's life expecting them to pay us back, but we never tell them the currency of that forgiveness. Because your future is attached to forgiveness. It's like the game with your spouse. How many married people do we have in the church this morning? Come on. You're like, oh, I guess I'm married. <laughs> but you get married, and it's like this game that the husbands usually play with their wives. When you're in trouble, you're like, well, babe, what's wrong? And you should know what's wrong. I'm like, okay. Well, I'm trying to ask you what's wrong. 
So can we talk about it? Well, if I tell you, then you really just don't care. You know what I'm talking about? Can all the, all the, all the men give me a silent amen? amen? Silent. You're going to get slapped. So you play this game, and it's like you have to guess what's wrong or guess what the problem is. But yet there's no help on the other end of the table. And you got to figure it out. That's kind of what unforgiveness is like for the other person. But just imagine this way. Let's just get a little personal. Just imagine like we were just worshiping, which Leah and the band, it was phenomenal. Really, it was amazing. Um, and you're awesome at drums. I'll just leave it at that. Um, it was so hard to worship. I was like, get it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it's like this. It's like if we were sitting here worshiping and, and we're, we're standing and we're, we're in front of our chair and we're worshiping and we go to worship and say, God, I have a, I have a meeting coming up at work, Lord, and I just need your guidance and I need your direction. Instead of him giving you peace, he reminds you of your past. It's like standing here worshiping and saying, God, I need you to help me. My, my son is about to go off to college or, God, I, my, my kids are growing up and my, my wife and I, we need guidance in our marriage. Will you please just help us with everything in our future that we're going through that we're about to step into? Or maybe you got a new job or, God, help me with this new job. And every time you ask God for something, he reminds you of your past. But the God that we serve doesn't do that, does he? Because he's forgiven us. Because he doesn't hold a debt over us. Because he doesn't keep us accountable for things that we probably should be accountable for. But he says, you know what, my grace is so good, I just want to give you a fresh start. And since I've extended forgiveness to you, will you please extend it to somebody else? Because as bad as I want to bring you into the future, there's a gap right there. And it's called unforgiveness. And until we learn how to forgive, we'll never step into what could be. Your future is attached to your forgiveness. If God doesn't hold a debt over our lives, why do we hold it over other people? What if this, oh my gosh, when God spoke this to me, it convicted me so hard. What if, what if the forgiveness that God extended to me and to you was based off of the forgiveness that we extended to other people? I don't know about you, but that convicts me. That cuts me deep because I know there are times and there are people and relationships in my life that I probably should forgive. I need to take a step and just say, you know what, I forgive you. I'm sorry for holding you hostage like that. What if the same forgiveness God extended to us was based off the forgiveness we extended to other people? Man, I think we might be a group of people that just might be in a little bit of trouble. Because our future is attached to forgiveness. There is no such thing or there should be no such thing as an unforgiving Christian. It's an oxymoron. An unforgiving Christian? You mean to tell me the thing that made me a Christian, forgiveness of my sins, of my wrongdoing, of my past, that made me a Christian, yet I'm going to be unforgiving to someone else? How can, how can the thing that made me a son of God block out other people from becoming a son of God? You want to move forward? You want to step into what God has for you? You've been praying for something for your future. Some of you in this room this morning, you've been praying for God to do something specifically. And he's saying, I want to so bad. But before I do something with your hands, I have to do something with your heart. And he wants you to forgive somebody in your life. Point number two is this. Is you can't love without forgiving. And you can't forgive without loving. You can't love without forgiving, and you can't forgive without loving. When you open the door for someone to love you, you open another door for someone to hurt you. It is not really a matter of if you're going to get hurt. It's honestly just a matter of when. I love my wife so much and would never in all my days want to hurt her, but I have done things to hurt her. I have done things that have upset her. There are times maybe I have reacted instead of responded because there's a difference. And I have to go to her and say, Brooke, I am, I am so sorry. The way that I just acted to you, that is not the heart of God. And if I'm to be more like Christ, that was not what he had wanted me to do. Will you please forgive me? And she says, yeah, I'll forgive you. 
Why? Because she loves me. Because you can't love without forgiving and you can't forgive without loving. The two have to go hand in hand. You can't have love without forgiveness. You can't have forgiveness without love. If so, it's not authentic. It's not genuine. It's not real. Forgiveness must be present in every relationship for that relationship to be possible. I'm not saying we got to go into relationships and have perfect ones. I'm saying we got to have persistent ones. And no matter what, I'm not going to give up. No matter what, I'm going to forgive. No matter what, I'm probably going to have to ask for forgiveness. Because as many times as Brooke and I have said I love you to one another, double that, we've probably said I forgive you to one another. Because neither one of us are perfect. Without forgiveness, a relationship never, ever gets better. It only gets bitter. Because in relationships, there has to be some sort of, of aspect that you say, it's not if, but it's when I need forgiveness or when I need to extend forgiveness. I'll never forget when Brooke and I were dating. And uh, we dated for six years before we got married. And, uh, and we live out in Prairieville, Louisiana. Anybody ever heard of Prairieville? Come on, Pville in the house. So we live out in uh, in Prairieville. I don't forget we were dating and um, we were driving down the road and we got in a fight. And how I many know high school fights are a little uh, a little immature? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like emotions are way too high, you know. And so we pull into this really fancy restaurant called Sonic and. Uh, and we pull in, and, you know, like you're in the heat of the fight, and it's one of those things, and I'm driving, and she's in the passenger seat, and I'm like, I'm just thinking in my head, this is how dumb I was, or probably still am, but I'm thinking, how can I win the fight? It's a bad place to be, is it not? I was not fighting for her, I was fighting with her, against her. And so I remember, how can I win this fight? And so I was trying to think of the best line in my head to just get her just to shut her down. And so we pull into Sonic, and I order the most anointed meal, chili cheese, tater frots, and tater tots, frots, fries, tater tots. And uh, we're fighting, and we're going at it, and uh, I finally said, you know what, Brooke? You just need to grow up. And as soon as I said that, and she's not the crier. I'm the crier. I'm like a little Italian chubby bunny crier. Man. So I say that. And I don't think I'd maybe seen her cry, but twice in, in all these years of dating. And, and I sold that to her, and I look over, and I'm like, oh, she didn't say nothing. I got her to be quiet. And I look over, and you all these little tears. Doop, doop. And I was like, oh, man. And I thought, that is not the way I wanted to feel. <laughs> that is not how I wanted this to go about. And so I had to ask her, hey, will you forgive me? The way I treated you, the way I acted towards you, the things that I just said to you were not really the life of Christ, not the mindset of God. And she, she said, yeah, I'll forgive you. And I realized that so many people talk about the basis of their relationship needs to be love, which it does. But there's an equal foundation, and that foundation has to be forgiveness. Because you cannot love without forgiving and you cannot forgive without loving. The two have to go hand in hand. Imagine if, if you wanted to go find your spouse or imagine the day you got married and at the altar you said, hey, I love you so much, but I'll never forgive you. Wait, what? You mean you're going to love me, but you can't forgive me? I don't, I don't think that's how this works. It was the love of Christ that came into our life and forgave us of our sins. It was the love of God for us to put his son on the cross. The two go hand in hand. One cannot be without the other. At some point, you're going to have to forgive your best friend. You're going to have to forgive your mom or your dad or your sibling. And if I could just be honest with you, at some point, you may even have to forgive your pastors. Because what I have learned today in my short time of ministry is that it's so sad how people put a platform of perfection on pastors. And we never celebrate when they're doing good. You know, the world never does that. We always point out the pastors who have fallen or who've messed up or who, who've, who haven't done things with integrity. And 
But what about, what about the pastors who left their hometown and came to New Orleans and planted a church and have worked their tail off? You know what I'm saying? You may have to, I've had to forgive my pastor. I've had to ask my students. I'm a student pastor at Healing Place in Baton Rouge, 6th through 12th grade, 400 crazy kids that are like, ah. And I have done things to upset them. And I have done things that maybe haven't been right. And I've had to ask them, hey, will you forgive me? Hey, Joe, will you, Joe, will you please forgive me? I should have not. I should have not come at you like that. Hey, Adam, I'm, I am sorry, bro. Will you please forgive me? Because at the end of the day, they may be pastors, but first they are sons and daughters of God. Just like me, just like you. So in order to have forgiveness, there has to be love. And in order to love, you, you have to be ready to forgive. The thing that I have found out is that so many people live their life led by their feelings. And it robs them of ever giving the opportunity to forgive someone. You've got to have forgiveness over your feelings. Amen? I think one of the most essential things in life is to not live your life based by your feelings. Because guess what? Your feelings do this. God's forgiveness is just a flat line. It makes everybody level. It does not matter if they're a celebrity or if they're homeless. It does not matter if they're the president of the United States or if they are a school teacher in Kenner, Louisiana. It is God's forgiveness that makes us all level. Because the only thing that we can contribute to our salvation was our sin. Was the things that we've done wrong. Were the things that we've messed up about. And because of his, his forgiveness, we're all made level. Amen? We cannot live a life based off of our feelings. Because I believe that forgiveness, forgiveness says to, to let go of your pride. But your feeling says to hold on to it. Forgiveness says to get out of your comfort zone and do the uncomfortable. But your feelings say, no, no, stay where you're comfortable. Stay in the box. Forgiveness says, step into your future. But your feelings say, no, no, stay in your past. Keep replaying that conversation where they messed you over. Forgiveness says to love without borders. But your feelings say to love with boundaries. Oh, I'll love you if you do that. I'll love you if you would treat me this way. I love you if, you if you get this for me or do that for me. When truthfully, we could offer nothing back to Jesus and he loved us anyway. You can't love without forgiveness. If you love someone, you're going to have to forgive them. If I could be honest with you this morning and just kind of unveil my heart to you, <clears throat> about two or three weeks ago, um, we, it was, it was in the afternoon and we were in the kitchen at my house and my son is running around being crazy like he always is and we wanted to make our life a lot more complicated so we got a puppy. <laughs> Dear God, help me. If anybody wants to buy a miniature Australian Shepherd, just let me know. Uh, but we got this puppy and y'all, it is like having two two-year-olds. And I mean, the dog will mess with the kid, with Eli and Eli will mess with the dog and Eli will eat his breakfast and whine when the dog, when Trip tries to take his food, but then he'll, when we're not looking, he'll throw Trip some food and be like, oh, and I'm like, you just gave it to him. I know you did. And they're constantly fighting, and, you know, I'll go up to Eli and open his hands, open his fists, and there's like a ball of, of Trip's hair right there in his hands. And I'm like, that poor dog. <laughs> and they're fighting, and they're going back and forth, man. And, and I don't do good. I don't do good when environments just start escalating with stress. It stresses me out. And so Eli did something to trip, and I grabbed Eli by his arm, and I spanked him right on, the, right on the rear end. And I'll never forget the look in his eyes. He just looked at me. And they were just playing. He didn't really do anything wrong. And my wife, she looked at me. She said, you, you need to go cool off. You're a little stressed out. You need to, to kind of go in the back for a minute. And, man, in that moment, I realized, man, what I did was so wrong. And I went back in my in the closet in our bedroom, and I just sat down in my closet, and I just began to weep, church. I just began to cry, and not like that. I mean like that, just snot bubbles and everything, man, just nah. I'm just weeping in my closet for probably 15, 20 minutes because I realized, man, one, I can't get that picture of my son's face out of my head when he looked at me, and two, I'm having these thoughts of he may not understand forgiveness, but I wonder if he'll forgive me. He's two years old. These are the thoughts I'm having in my head. Because I want to be a good dad. I want to be a good father. 
And I, I'm thinking, will he remember this as he gets older? It's really not. I mean, in the grand scheme, Paul, you just spanked your kid. You shouldn't have oh well, right? But in me, I'm taking it hard. I'm in my closet. I'm just crying, and I'm praying to God, and I, God, I'm sorry. God, that's not what your heart beats. That's not, that's not what I should have done. I was not being a good father. I'm praying. I'm crying. And I finally, I come, I walk out of the closet through our bedroom. I go into the living room. And there's my son, and he comes up to me. He puts his arms up, and I pick him up, and he just wraps his arms around me and hugs me. Now, he didn't say this, obviously, because he's two, but to me, it was like in that moment, he said, Dad, I forgive you. I just spanked him. And, man, I, again, I start, I just start kind of tearing up again because I realized if a two-year-old who can just blabber off words <laughs> and not speak good English <laughs> and portray what forgiveness is like to me, how come adults stay in bondage? How come adults cannot go up to their mom or their dad and just give them a hug and say, I forgive you? How come adults, how come we can't go up to our friends and say, I no longer hold you hostage for what you did, I forgive you? You can't love without forgiving, and you can't forgive without loving. I've learned that I'll probably never be a perfect father, but I will be a forgiven father. Because I am first a forgiven son. Because God loves me, he loves you, and you are forgiven. Amen? Amen. The third thing I want to say is this, is your freedom is attached to forgiveness. Your freedom is attached to forgiveness. I think about this story in Luke chapter 15. I think about the conversation that happened between the younger son and the father. And he says, Dad, I want my inheritance. Let's just call it what it is. He's telling his dad, hey, Dad, you're as good as dad to me. I want all the money you've set aside for me. I want it now. And he goes off and squanders off this money, as the Bible says. He spends it on prostitutes. The Bible says he spends it on wild living. And he's just living this crazy life. And then he comes back, and his brother, his brother is off working in the fields, the Bible says. And he's walking up to the house, and he, and he says, you know, what's that music? And a servant says to the older brother, oh, your, your younger brother who went off and squandered all your dad's money, who spent it all, who, who lived a crazy life for a little while, the one who pretty much ended up homeless and working for a farmer and feeding pigs for a living. The Bible says that even one day the pig's food looked appetizing to the younger son as he was out there. Oh, yeah, he's come back home, and your father has received him back in with open arms. And that fattened calf that we were probably saving for some other party, yeah, we threw that party for your younger brother. And he gets upset, and he says, I'm not going in there. So one dialogue is, Dad, can I please come back home? And he says, yes. And there's one brother who's always been home but doesn't want to go home now. And they're throwing a party. You see, the son, the older son wanted payback. But the father just wanted to get his son back. The older son, he wanted revenge, but the father just wanted restoration. So now this father is honestly stuck in a hard place. Because one son needs grace for the things that he's done. And the other son needs grace for the things that he won't do. Aren't you thankful that God extends grace into all the areas of our life? When we do the things that we should and do the things that we shouldn't, he still extends his grace into our world. You see, this older brother is now about to sit in bondage because he refuses to forgive his father. He refuses to forgive his younger brother because he fails to realize that his freedom is completely connected to his forgiveness. Do you remember the days that you didn't know Jesus? Remember the days that you felt so in bondage, so chained up, so locked up, but the day that you met Jesus and came face to face with him and accept, accepted him into your heart, that was the day that you felt freedom like you've never felt it before? 
For me, I remember that day like it was yesterday. I remember November 4th, 2001. Accepting Jesus into my heart as a 10-year-old. As a 10-year-old, how many really bad sins can you commit? You know what I'm saying? It wasn't a whole lot. I mean, what, I stole a Tootsie Roll, tootsie roll from the grocery store. You know what I mean? Like, it wasn't a ton of stuff. I didn't go squander money on prostitutes. I didn't go live this wild life. But it does not matter because when I was born, I was born into sin. Therefore, I am a sinner. But the day that I accepted Jesus, November 4th, 2001, I remember my aunt asking me, so what do you feel like? I said, Aunt Johnette, that's from Watson, you know that. Aunt Johnette, I feel, <laughs> I feel like a thousand pounds has been lifted off of me. I felt freedom like I never felt before. At 10 years old, I didn't even really know how to pray, but I remember going to bed. You can ask my dad because our room, our room was right next to theirs, right next to mom and dad's. And I would just pray this prayer over and over. God, you're the king of kings. You're the Lord of lords. Thank you for saving me. And I would pray that over and over and over for weeks because this was a freedom that I didn't know that I needed, but that I finally got. And now this older son is going to sit in bondage because he refuses to forgive his brother or his dad. Your freedom is attached to your forgiveness. Because what happened was the younger son got home and the dad said, hey, why don't you go grab a few things? Okay, sir, what do you need us to grab? He says, I want you to grab my ring, I want you to grab my robe, and I want you to grab my sandals. You think about those three things. Interesting things to say that he would like for his son to have, right? He's just been sleeping with pigs, the Bible tells us. What about a shower, Dad? <laughs> what about a little Old Spice Pure Sport deodorant? You know what I'm saying? He doesn't say those things, though. The Bible says that the father sees his son from afar and takes off running towards him and hugs him and kisses him. In that time, a man who owned that much livestock, that type of harvest, had servants and all that kind of stuff, they didn't run for anything because they had people that would run for them. But this father says, the Bible says this father sees his son from afar. You know what that tells me? That tells me that his father had been waiting on that porch every single day. When is my son going to come home? Is he, is he, no, no, that's just the neighbors, Okay. Wait, is that? No, that's not him. <gasps> he probably screamed, that's my son, takes off running across the field, the very field that his son worked, the very field that his son got money off of and went and squandered it. It's the very field that he's using to run across to reach his son and to embrace him and hug him and not hold a grudge against him but hold grace over him. Not remind him of his failures but to extend forgiveness to his life. And he takes off running and he embraces him and he hugs him. Do you remember the day that Jesus came running after you and embraced you and hugged you and said, I love you and I forgive you? And he brings you into the house. Come on, let's give him a shout of praise this morning. He brings you into his home, into his family. And he says, Go get the robe, go get the ring, go get the sandals. The robe signified God's favor on his life. The ring signified God's authority. And the sandals, that actually signified a covering of shame. Because what happens was in those days, if you didn't have sandals on your feet in public, that was considered to be a lifestyle of poverty. So what was he doing? He gave him his sandals and said, hey, I, I, I'm covering your shame and I'm giving you back your identity. And I think about this story and think about the very forgiveness that our God has offered to us. That he would take off his sandals. That God would send down his son to die for us and say, instead of keeping my son for myself, I realize my sons and my daughters, they need him more than I do. I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what you've walked in here with. But I do know this, is that whether you have been saved for a month for 10 years, or maybe you don't even know Jesus. God is waiting on the porch for you. And he's looking for you, maybe to extend forgiveness into your life. But not just for you to keep it, but for you to extend it to others. The keys can go ahead and come up. I want to share this last couple thoughts with you. 
at the end of the day, it honestly was not about the failure of the younger son. It was about the forgiveness that the older son wasn't willing to extend. Too many people, too many people walk around this earth, walk around this city. You've seen it in New Orleans. Too many people walk around this city with handcuffs on thinking that the key to their freedom is in the other person's hands. But truthfully, the key to their freedom is in their own hands. And that key is called forgiveness. It's about forgiving someone. But I have a feeling that it may just not about be it may just not be about receiving forgiveness or extending forgiveness for somebody else. Maybe that forgiveness is about you forgiving yourself for some things. I don't know if you've ever been there, but you feel like you haven't been living the way you want to. You haven't made the decisions that you thought you would make. Your life is not in the place that you predicted that it would be in, and you can't forgive yourself. Some of you this morning, you need to forgive yourself and just let go. Let go of forgiveness and hold on to the Father. Freedom is never present as long as forgiveness is absent. Your freedom is attached to your forgiveness. The Bible says that Jesus walked along this road, went to this hill, and hung on a cross for me and for you. I have learned that in 17 years of knowing Christ and doing my best to live for Him, the story of the cross can never get old to me. It can never become mundane to me. It is not just a story that we read to the kids next door. It is something that we as adults have to live out every single day. And as we've entered into this last words series, I want to read you this passage in its fullness. Luke chapter 23, verse 32. Just listen, just listen right here. It says, two others, both criminals were led out to be executed with him. When they came to a place called the skull, they nailed him, they nailed Jesus to the cross, and the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, hold them hostage. Father, send down your wrath. Father, make them pay for what they've done. No, he didn't say any of those things. He said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. And the crowd watched. The story breaks me down every time. And the leaders scoffed. And this is what they said. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself. If he is really the son, if he is really God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers mocked him by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. A sign was fastened above him with these words, this is the king of the Jews. Do we really think that Jesus did not have the ability to save himself? He did. You and I both know that. But he was not interested in his freedom. He was interested in yours. As he hung on that cross. Do we really think that Jesus couldn't get down from the cross? No, he could get down from the cross if he wanted to. But that meant that you and I would have to be on that cross, and he didn't want that. The crowd, the soldiers, the leaders, they say, save yourself. Come on, if you're really the king of the Jews, if you're really God's chosen one, save yourself. And Jesus just might have been thinking, it's not because of who I am. that you should get up here. It's because of who I am that you should stay down there. You want me to get down from the cross because of who I am? No, because of who I am, I'll stay up here. You think I'm interested in saving myself? That's why I should get down? No, I'm interested in saving you. That's why I'm gonna stay up. And he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. I'm not getting off the cross to save myself. I'm going to stay up here to save you. A people that would spit on him and gamble for his clothes and mock him and 
put a sign over his head to make fun of him. That's the Jesus that we know. I want to close with this story and then we'll pray, but a couple years ago, a movie came out called American Sniper. I don't know if you've ever seen this movie, but it is an awesome movie. It's so good. And I went and saw this movie, and at the end of the movie, God began to speak to me through this movie. And I don't know if you know this, or I've ever had this, but do you know that it is not just here in this room that God wants to speak to you? It is at your workplace. It is in your kitchen. And it could just happen to be in a movie theater. And I'm watching this movie, and then God starts reminding me and bringing to light all of this unforgiveness that I have towards my older brother. My older brother, this story of the prodigal son is a lot like my brother and I's story that he first went to Healing Place Church and got saved back in 2000. And then from that decision, I went to the church and I got saved. And my dad got saved and my mom got saved and my sister got saved and started this little revival within our family, right? Well, then a year or two later, he runs back off and starts doing drugs again and partying and living in the world and in and out of jail and all these things. And I had a lot of unforgiveness towards my brother. And in this time, I'm watching this movie, and I'm sitting in this movie theater, and I'll never forget my, one of my best friends, Jake. He's sitting right beside me. And I'm watching this movie, and God just starts speaking to me through this movie, American Sniper. And I just start tearing up. And the movie ends, and he's like, what did you think of the movie? I was like, it was good. I'm like, it's it? I'm like, yeah, it was good. We get in his car, he's driving, we're going back to my house, and I'm looking out the window because I can't control it anymore. Tears are just coming down my face. And he said, bro, what is, are you crying? I was like, no, <laughs> I'm okay. And he said, dude, what is wrong? I said, man, I've realized that, like, I've been trying to move forward. I've been trying to have freedom. I've been acting like I love my brother but I didn't want to extend forgiveness to him after all these years 10-15 years of him in and out of jail doing drugs causing so much pain to my parents and to his kids and I thought that I was the good son that stayed back home and he's the bad son who went out and squandered the money and did all these things God spoke to me and said, Paul, both of those sons needed my grace. And you need my grace, and your brother needs my grace, and you need to forgive him. I get home at 9.30, walk in the house, my eyes are bloodshot. Brooke's like, what is wrong? I'm like, look, I've, I've got to go see my brother. She was like, right now? I'm like, right now. Okay. So I go to my brother's house, knock on the door, he opens it. He says, man, what are you doing? I said, we got to talk. I said, God showed me that in the prodigal son that just because I stayed at home, it doesn't mean I was closer to the father. That my heart is far because I refuse to forgive you. So I need to ask your forgiveness, man. He starts crying. He said, only if you'll forgive me. Only, only, if, uh, only if you'll forgive me too. And so we just cry and I forgive you. I forgive you. And in that moment in my life, things started to progress forward. And to be honest with you, my brother was doing great about three months ago. And now he's kind of starting to fall back in that trap. But you know what I've realized, church? I've realized that forgiveness is not affirmed or negated based on somebody's response or what their life is. Forgiveness is to set your heart free. And so this morning, I don't really know where you're at. I don't know if you need to extend forgiveness or if you need to receive forgiveness. But for some of us in this room, in order to extend forgiveness, that might take, it takes definitely one conversation, but it may take two. The first conversation is going to take a conversation between you and your, your creator, you and your Lord, you and God. Say, God, I'm sorry. I need to forgive so-and-so. Or I need to forgive myself. 
the second conversation might be, be, might be between you and the person you need to forgive. And that's why I say that their response or their reaction does not affirm or negate what God has done in your life for you to extend forgiveness. Because they may not receive it the way that you wanted to. And then the second thing is this, is you may need to receive forgiveness for yourself. There may be some things in your life you're not proud of. There may be some things in your heart that you're ashamed of. But I've learned there's never a failure that is too big for God's forgiveness. Amen? Amen. If we could just bow our heads and close our eyes, I just want to do this real quick. And nobody looking around. It's just a moment between you and God. If you say, Paul, this morning, one of those two things really hit home with me. And I don't just want an emotional experience on a Sunday morning, but I want an experience and an encounter that causes me to take action. And if you say, Paul, this morning, I know that one of those two things were for me. I need to either extend forgiveness or receive forgiveness. Nobody looking around. If that's you, just lift your hand up high. Unashamed. Wow. Thank you so much for your honesty, for your authenticity. Thank you. Come as a church, why don't we all just pray this prayer, all of us together out loud. Say, Jesus, thank you for your forgiveness. Help me to extend forgiveness. Because I am forgiven, I should also forgive. Thank you for the cross, for your sacrifice, for setting me free. I don't deserve it. I haven't earned it, but I receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give God a hand clap.